everybody. Welcome to the awesome April conversation with Joanne Greenfield, which is brought to you, of course, by the Australasian Women in Emergencies Network, or AWE. My name is Bridget, and I'm the president of AWE. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land where I'm seated today. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and of course, extend that respect to all Aboriginal peoples who may be viewing today. I'd encourage you all to, to pop your acknowledgement in the chat and let us know what country you're sitting on. I think one of the fantastic things about or is that we come from all different nations uh, from across Australia, and it's always fascinating to see uh, what country people are sitting on, where they're from and, and who they're acknowledging. Um, and it's a really part, important part of um, what we all do. So for those of you um, who, who know all, we are the Australasian Women in Emergencies Network. We're a membership-based organisation and we promote, support and recognise the contributions of women in emergency management and disaster resilience. So I'd like to welcome all our members who are attending this event today. Um, just to let you know, we will be recording this session. Um, so that means that we can uh, pop it on our YouTube channel and it will be available for, for other members to view at their leisure and for you to come back to if you need to, as well as for you to share with your broader networks. Don't forget to include any questions for Joanne in the chat. We'll get to them throughout the, the session this afternoon. Um, but um, enough of the preliminaries, so we're here today to hear, of course, from Joanne Greenfield. And Joanne's had a really extraordinary career. This has included leading large scale operations in really complex environments, not only in Queensland, but internationally. Joanne's led health services for more than 300,000 refugees, the London Helicopter Emergency Services, hospitals and clinics in Kosovo, emergency services at King's College Hospital and food and medicine supply chains across 10 countries. Of course, today, Joanne is Assistant Commissioner of the Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. I know I, for one, am really interested to hear more about Joanne's career, um, her early work and what's led her today to, to be Assistant Commissioner at Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. So a huge thank you and welcome to Joanne. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. It's quite, oh. it's quite nice to have a small number of us. I think it'll be a cosy chat. It will be indeed, absolutely. And we'll be really keen to have questions from, from all of you as, as we talk. So Joanne, I guess I was really interested um, to hear about how you got to where you are today, including your international humanitarian work. Um, and for those of you who may know, um, there was an ADA event just earlier today with Mark Crosweller, who was talking about the importance of being vulnerable and acknowledging vulnerability. And I think that humanitarian work is something that's um, really valuable in this space and something that lends itself really nicely. And, and one of the things I'd be interested to hear about, Joanne, are your reflections on how your humanitarian work um, is informing the work you're doing in the emergency management sector. Over to you, Joanne. Sure. Um, thanks, Bridget. And hello, everyone. Um, so I started out life in, in the UK. I still can't get rid of the accent it's been around the world, but it still stays. Um, and I started out as a nurse in the UK and a midwife. Um, and I ended up in emergency departments and intensive care units um, after something happened at the end of my training that sort of took me there really, um, a particular patient that I followed um, and it sparked my interest. And I spent, I guess, those first 10 years of my career try, you know, doing lots and lots of technical training to try and be the technical best that I could as a clinician um, and, and ended up as a nurse practitioner and advanced trauma life support specialist. And by nature of that, I sort of got involved in a few large scale incidents in London. This is the 90s, so we had a different threat, but we did have some bombings with large scale multiple traumas. So that sort of led me into the thinking about large scale incidents and what that, and that took me onto the national, the London Emergency Committee. Um, and I, was, I did some work where I was invited to go overseas to Sarajevo at a time where you know, international community were active and involved. And I went over to Sarajevo to do advanced trauma life support training at the beginning of the Bosnian and, and conflict. 
Um, and that really sparked my interest. And I'd been in emergency medicine for quite a few years. And, you know, I had this moment where I realized that, you know, I didn't know how long I wanted to pick people up from the side of the road. I call it my public health moment, where I realized that prevention was better than cure. And I'd had this experience in Sarajevo and, and realized that there was a bigger need out there than just London. And so it attracted me to look for an international role. Um, and I went overseas for the first time um, for um, a non-government organization and they were called Merlin at the time. They were equivalent of MSF. Um, uh, they were two founding members of MSF France and they'd come back to London and set up Merlin. Um, and, and I went to Afghanistan for about 18 months um, and I was really struck. Um, I was there before the Taliban and after the Taliban, so you can tell the time. And I wore a borka through most of that time. Um, and, and I was really struck. I'd spent all these years trying to be this fabulous technical clinician and the top of my game. And, you know, the first baby I delivered, none of that really mattered um, because I didn't have the health system or, or the support around me. So I thought I was pretty, you know, I was young. I was in my late 20s. You know, I thought I was pretty hot. I thought I was pretty good at what I did and none of it mattered. You know, babies and, and mothers were, you know, died on me because the system wasn't around me. Um, so I think that was one of my early realizations that, you know, we have to build this humanitarian or emergency management or health system um, and build it with the community because it didn't matter what I did um, in Afghanistan in my borka unless the community accepted it, then, you know, not only was my own security at threat, but so were the, the lives of the women that I was engaging with. So working with the community, I really learned that lesson pretty hard there. Um, and, and getting acceptance from, you know, even, you know, people that, you know, you wouldn't normally negotiate with, you know, the Taliban and their religious leaders to allow you to, to continue to deliver babies. Um, and I worked on a few big disease outbreaks, measles and cholera in, in that time frame. And again, what struck me was, you know, if you could give the simple technology to the community, you know, really simple stuff like in a cholera outbreak, big barrels filled with clean water, then the community would look after themselves. Um, so again, it was about how did you empower the community? Um, and there were some, those lessons I think have stood me in good stead from those really early days. Um, the other thing I learned both in my health career and the humanitarian career um, was how important multidisciplinary teams are. Um, and you know, I'm a nurse, so I come from a, a female dominated profession. Um, and I've ended up in this male dominated profession. Um, so what I learned as a nurse, I think as a female having to talk to often male doctors who are more senior and you know, ultimately the decision makers is how do you talk that truth to those people that you see to have some power over you. Um, so I think I took that from my female dominated profession into now of a male orientated profession. Um, and that multidisciplinary team, those leaders that I work with, both in the humanitarian space and the health space, the ones I really learned from were the ones who recognised the value of that multidisciplinary team and that everyone in the team mattered. Um, and, you know, at the end of the 90s, I went to Kosovo um, and it was a reconstruction effort. So we would have been the first vehicle over the border after the NATO bombing stood. Um, stopped after the military entered, then I was the first civilian vehicle. Um, and again, we, it was a large scale reconstruction effort to get all the health services up and running after the bombing um, and you know, years of neglect. And I focused very much on the technical. How do I get a neonatal unit up and running? How do I run a trauma center when there were still um, injuries from landmines happening and from ordinance like that? Um, and I missed the basics. I missed the basics of making sure the cleaners were paid, making sure the cleaning materials were there. And of course we have an outbreak of infection in the hospital. So I was focused at the very technical end and I missed the most important person in the team. Um, and so that was a pretty strong lesson about multidisciplinary teams and valuing everyone. I think we're seeing that during COVID, you know, the cleaners in those hotels are just as important as you know, the police and the military and the nurses and the doctors, the cleaners are the ones that are, you know, keeping us safe, really. Um, so that was a really big lesson. Um, 
And those leaders that I work with, I remember one leader in Kosovo and Kenya that I worked with, he was a public health physician um, and, and he'd been through, um, you know, he was, he was a Ugandan national and he'd been through years of oppression in Uganda and he'd always stood by what was right. And he continued to be a doctor, even though he was persecuted for being a doctor. So seeing those level of integrity are pretty impactful on you, I think. And so it's one of my values now that whatever we do, we have to work with the community and we have to remember why we're doing it, um, no matter the pressures or the stresses that we're under. Um, yeah, after Afghanistan, I did try, I went back to London. I'd got another job. I tried to settle and yeah, it didn't last very long. I, I stayed about 18 months. I'd stayed long enough to finish my master's um, in infectious disease, epidemiology and policy and economics. And, and then I went back overseas and I went back overseas to Kosovo um, and, and worked again in this very large multidisciplinary team. It was a joint humanitarian and military operation or peacekeeping operation. So that was interesting to lead a team in the health recovery space that was you know, a civilian and a military team. And as the, you know, one of the team leaders to work across those disciplines um, and, and you know, work out how you communicate across disciplines was a really important learning. Um, when I came back um, from Kosovo, I'd met my husband by then and we said, we better try and live in the same country. Um, so we went to Zimbabwe together um, and it was a pretty difficult time in Zimbabwe. The, um, the, you know, the independence movement was trying to stay alive um, and they were invading a lot of the farmers' properties then they were largely white, white farmers and the economy plummeted. So what was a really robust primary healthcare system post-independence that had been built just crumbled. Um, and it crumbled at what was the height of the HIV AIDS epidemic. So we had um, Zimbabwean soldiers coming back from the Democratic Republic of the Congo um, who in 60% of them were HIV positive. I worked with villages over that period of time where we lost a generation, um, you know, of, of parents. And, and so we either ended up with child headed households or grandparents heading the household. Um, and again, the big lesson for me there was those communities that we'd worked with in a really participatory manner um, to find their own solutions were the communities who came out the strongest. They were far more resilient um, rather than doing to them sitting down and, and working with them and, you know, facilitating that rather than, you know, telling them what to do, those communities did far better. And I don't think that's any different than Queensland or Victoria or New South Wales. Um, it was a really strong lesson. Um, and I continued in Africa um, from Zimbabwe, I went to Kenya. And I was meant to be there building things, building house systems, building resilience in house systems. And I ended up as is the nature in, in some of our you know, countries with you know, less economic benefit than we have, they do go from one disaster to another. So I ended up in the UN system, either as a, a coordinator of a cluster, so a health strategic command, we would call it, or overall, over all the clusters in the UN system as a commander. Um, and again, I was struck by the leaders there with integrity. Um, there was one particular event um, in Kenya post an election where the election um, was disputed the result and it led to some inter, inter conflict within the country with different communities pitched against each other. Um, I think one of the most impactful days was the Boxing Day, um, day after Boxing Day on, so it must have been 2008. And I went in a Red Cross flight over a church with the director of medical services, the Kenyan director of medical services. And we flew over a church where women and children inside had, had unfortunately died. They'd been burnt in there. Um, and he, he stood up against all his colleagues who were getting sucked into the, the tribal violence. And, and he said, right, my job here is to work with you as WHO and we're going to protect the evidence. We're going to protect the evidence so it can go into the International Criminal Court. And he, he stood really tall and he stood up against his own community to do that because his own community was were the perpetrators of the, the violence. Um, and so seeing leaders like that just, you know, blew me away. Those leaders with integrity and bravery. Um, I don't think I can ever hope to be that brave, I think, but there, there's amazing people out there. 
um, and I've been incredibly lucky to work with them. Um, I think I also learned both in, you know, in Africa, you know, they, at the time their national budget for health was $9 per head. I think ours is about two and a half thousand per dollars per head. So, but the innovation and the preparedness to be brave and to do things differently was just incredible. Um, so even in those difficult cir circumstances, there were people coming up with great ideas and if we could fund it, they were prepared to do it. So, you know, it's quite amusing now. I shouldn't say amusing. We managed to vaccinate 4 million people in three days and give out 4 million bed nets in the same three days in Kenya, you know, a country that spends $9 per head on its health service. So, you know, I, I think we think we're pretty advanced here, but there's lots of innovation out there and lots of ability to deliver um, that we could learn from. Um, so it was very humbling, very humbling. Um, I'll stop there, I think. So I came to Australia. Um, I went to Ghana after that and again worked on, you know, there was a, at the time of the H1M1 pandemic, so I ended up leading that for the UN across about four West African countries. Um, so I've done a few pandemics in my time, unfortunately. There was a, a drought and a, you know, malnutrition crisis as well at the same time. But I got recruited by AusAid to come to Australia. Um, a doctor who'd been the head of child health in WHO was in AusAid and he was retiring. And he said, come and work for camp, come and work in AusAid. Um, and that's how I came to Australia. Um, I think I last, you know, I'll be honest, I lasted about three years and it was a bureaucracy. And, you know, having been on the, in operations for so long, I struggled with that. So I was very happy when this opportunity came up in Queensland to get back to sort of emergency and disaster management and, and be a bit more focused on direct, direct community engagement and support. Wow, wow. Joanne, Joanne, that's just, just extraordinary. extraordinary. I'm sorry, sorry. I can hear I an can echo. Can anyone, anyone else? else? Yeah. yeah. Go on mute. Sorry about that. Maybe that's better. Um, what an extraordinary, um, profound, and frankly, exhausting sounding <laughs> career. Um, and it, really incredible. I, I've just got so many things whirling around in my head. Um, interesting that you talk about the health crisis crises a lot and it's something that we're not very good at dealing with in Australia and you know COVID really took us by surprise I think you know being being um, a comfortable kind of western nation where our problems tend to be more chronic health problems rather than things like pandemics or, or outbreaks of, of terrible disease um, that we're probably um, not well prepared at all um, and interesting about your comment about innovation in countries um, that are poorly resourced I heard an interview with um, the health minister from Rwanda I think it was on the radio last week um, talking about the response to COVID. And of course, I think the whole world was sort of holding its breath in concern about how COVID would impact African countries. Um, and what she was talking about in how that country responded and the innovation, the way they just used the very, very local community level um, responses to, to really stem the flow of the pandemic was absolutely extraordinary and, and really quite inspiring. Um, for me too, just personally, I think your comments about working in, um, in Bosnia, I, I had my first baby at about that time. And I remember watching the news with this tiny baby in my arms and the vision of entire families and their possessions with babies in arms, fleeing, literally fleeing for the hills. And I remember picturing myself um, having to walk, you know, to the Dandenongs or somewhere with a baby in my arms. And I, I, I just couldn't conceive of it. And my heart absolutely went out to these to these people. And it was a real, really defining point for me as, as a new mother um, and as a woman for, for, for what other women and other mothers have to go through um, in really tough times. Were there any questions for Joanne from anyone about those extraordinary years of your career? I, I have a question. Thank you. Uh, apologies for being late. And um, thank you for your excellent presentation. Um, just speaking about in Zimbabwe, you mentioned um, that you found the communities where there was a participatory approach to, um, re you know, response and recovery was much more effective than when people were told. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about like how that looked and what how you got community involvement and um, sort of what were the on the ground things that made it participatory 
Sure. So I think I was working um, on something called the Integrated Management of Childhood Illness, and it recognises in those countries that there's about five things that cause 70% of under five deaths. Um, so we had that knowledge, um, but the system wasn't resourced to take a curative approach to that. So, so we had to go to the community and with local leaders sit down and say, this is what we're seeing. This is the knowledge we have, but you know, can you actually tell us what's going on for you in the community? And it was, you know, really going through conversation after conversation with them, mapping it, um, getting them to diagnose what they thought were the problems. And they, you know, they really took it on board and were really engaged in that. Um, there was a lot of facilitation, but it was really about facilitating the community to have the issue. We literally just put the problem statement on the table and they turned it on, on its head. And I remember one community said, well, you know, because my answer was, well, surely you need more midwives, you know, that must be what you need. And said, no, no, we need a road. It's actually a road we need so that we can get our goods out so we can sell our tomatoes or whatever the good of the day was and then we can pay for our own services. So they weren't actually asking for a handout in any shape or form. They, they, they knew that they needed a bit of infrastructure and they were right. And that would reduce maternal mortality. So my notion, oh, well, I just trained more nurses was completely wrong. Um, if, if we gave them, you know, we gave them what they asked for, I worked with the World Bank and they put the investment in and they were right. They got more women, they got their produce out to market, they became economically more viable. They actually then could support their own local clinic and, and it had an impact on their health. Um, so those could, that same community, um, when it was hit by a cholera outbreak, um, we had some massive cholera outbreaks in Zimbabwe with some very resistant cholera strains that were quite devastating in their impact. Those communities that we've been through that process in actually did much better. They worked out how to manage this themselves before we even got to them. They were already on the road to finding how to deal with it. Um, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Whereas those communities we hadn't been to were sitting waiting. Um, so it, it really mobilised that self, self resilience and, and able to come together as a group and, and building that confidence. I'm just going to run and get a drink. Sorry. <laughs> Please do, Joanne. <laughs> Poor thing. <laughs> um, what an amazing um, career it just did. And it put so many things in perspective, I think. Um, in terms of what we're facing here in Australia. I was just thinking the same thing, Bridget, when, when we, from our privileged positions, really grizzle and complain about things that happen and then see how quickly countries that are so much lower standard of living than us can mobilise. It's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that we tend to look to these countries as, as less developed, but in actual fact, they're way ahead of us in terms of things like innovation, um, things like working closely with community and stuff. And as Joanne said, there's so much we can learn from countries like those. Sorry about that. That's better. <laughs> I had a question along those lines. Joanne, I know you haven't heard our little conversation while you dashed out for a drink. <laughs> I'm really interested, though, in asking you how, if, and how you process the sorts of things you've been describing that you've experienced in other countries, um, with living in a in a first world country and doing a sort of a day job. How, how do you integrate, and how do you cope? What do you do? Yeah, it is. I think, I think that coming. I've reflected on it over the years. It was useful coming from an acute service background because part of what you learn in your early career is managing yourself first. Um, and I don't, you know, if I walk into an emergency department and it's quiet, I know they're having a very bad day. Um, I know they are probably resuscitating people there. You know, so that sense of calm and ability to prioritise and, and deal with things, I was very lucky that that was in my early training. I think that really stood me in good stead, um, which other professions will do. I don't think that's unique to, to emergency rooms or intensive care, but I think that that really helped me. Um, 
was very lucky in my career, like I say, working with some amazing leaders who were really supportive, um, who were able to, the best ones I think, worked out my strengths before I did and, and played to them. Um, and I think having good leaders help you on your journey is really important. Um, I, I did find it hard. I think, you know, although, you know, I say um, it was hard to come to AusAid after all those times, it was hard to come out of the field and to adjust. Um, it was hard to reintegrate. Um, even for my kids, my kids have been born in Kenya. I had them in Kenya. Um, and so when they came um, to Australia, they were still small, but they hadn't drunk water out of a tap. They hadn't, you know, they were used to the power going off. They um, you know, they slept under bed nets. So my son now, I think he's 18, he still sleeps with a torch under his pillow because he thinks the power might go off, you know, those little things. I remember the first time I, she was about five when we came, my youngest, and she saw a water bubbler. She had no idea you could have a water bubbler with clean water in it in the middle of the, you know, park. That was just, so all these things were, I think that we realised how privileged we were and that helped with the adjustment is recognising our privilege and how fortunate we are. And I think that's that's the same now. I, you know, it still lives with me even in the bushfires in 2019 in Queensland. Again, I just felt how lucky I was. You know, it wasn't my community affected. You know, it wasn't my house, but, you know, Queenslanders were going through this and I was in this incredible position where I could provide some support or make sure they got the resources that they need. So it's... I think it, I've always taken this position of privilege and, and that's helped me keep, you know, I guess a level head through it all. Um, it's good to have, you know, I've had an incredibly strong family base who I've always gone back to. My husband's been pretty amazing. I met him in Afghanistan, so he's probably the only person who could have understood what it was like coming back to London, um, you know, and how that was um, and reintegrating um, but I think it's the same as any emergency or, or frontline worker. You, you have to learn to cope, you know, you have to divide up your brain some days and say, I, I can't help if I carry the grief or the pain. I have to compartmentalize it in my brain so I can do my job. And again, I think that comes from probably, you know, being a clinician or, you know, same when you're, if you're resuscitating someone, you have to do the same. Although you know it's a person, you have to do your job, follow your training, follow your protocol so that you can do your job and then you know, you'll know think about it afterwards. So I don't know whether that answers your question entirely, but. Joanne, um, a question to you arising from your experience and, and what you've been telling us about um, the experience you had with the communities of resilience and their capacity for really creative and productive independent functioning. What um, lessons could you take from, from those experiences to us here in Australia? Because we have a lot of talk about building resilience in communities, um, about supporting people to um, find their own pathway and to make the journey on their pathway. Um, and there's a lot of conversation about that. What learnings do you think you could transfer into our situation? Oh, it's a good question. I think that if, we, if, I, if I talk about COVID, I guess, I am worried COVID has been a very top-down policy-driven response, isn't it? Right up to National Cabinet has been making these decisions. I think that now as we try and recover, we'll have to live with COVID and, and work out what the new world is. We have to engage the community in that. I don't think we can keep doing it as a top-down approach. So the lesson for me is how, how do we engage the community in those conversations about what does it look like? Um, otherwise, I think we'll lose their trust. Um, you know, they've been, Australians have just been incredible to me through, through COVID. They've listened and they've responded every time. Um, the community will only have patience with you for so long, I think, as a, as a government or an agency. So I think we have to go out and engage now and, and really find out what's happened on the ground during COVID, those small communities that have been impacted and, and ask them the questions about, okay, what's next? How do, how do we come out of this together? Um, so I think the big lesson is, yeah, go and ask the community. Um, I think that 
in our recovery efforts, again, it's interesting, we did a lot of work on recovery and, you know, there was, you know, I remember standing in a field in Uganda one day and um, the Americans were dropping, you know, coming to drop the food supplies um, and, and to allow that plane and helicopter drop to happen, we had to get locals to come and cut the grass down in the field. Um, I thought, wow, if I'm cutting grass down, surely we can grow something here. This is, you know, yet I'm having to bring all this food in from America. Um, and so I think that we still do that in recovery in Australia. We still go in, open a community hub, drop a lot of things without actually saying, well, you know, if I use the analogy, how could you grow your own food in this field? Um, and we did a lot of work around rather than giving things, if you could direct the funds so the community can decide how to respond. So directly injecting cash grants. And there was a huge debate about how you did that in those countries, you know, because oh, people might spend it on the wrong things. Um, but actually it proved the most effective thing. And what we found was if we gave it to the female head of the household, she definitely spent it on the right things. Um, and she definitely helped her family recover far, you know, very quickly. So I think those sorts of lessons are really important, you know, whereas we tend to, you know, give things or put money into, you know, systems, whereas actually if we could get closer to community and get the, the support closer to community, we'd probably recover a lot quicker. But we have these layers of bureaucracy. We're very good at it. <laughs> and similarly, I think a lot of the uh, support agencies coming in also um, provide rather than actually support up. Yes, they provide down. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 We know, we know best, best, don't we? <laughs> Any other questions? Anne? Uh, yes, yeah, so in a highly urbanised society like ours, we, you know, we, we talk a lot about communities and community resilience and a lot of the examples, even Australia, centre around regional communities. Um, but, and we were really, really lucky in the last bushfires that the major urban centres weren't really um, highly impacted. But one day, um, and COVID maybe is going to be one of the things, how do we contact communities in large urban centres when that, that sense of community isn't necessarily there? I mean, for my feeling with sort of COVID is that the sort of, the community that I'm in that's talking about how we change to go into a new way of living is actually my work community. My local community, I don't really hear any debate about that. <laughs> um, if there was a, a major disaster that came through here, you know, I mean, I'm in, you know, the middle of Sydney, um, I, I'm not sure that there's a community to go to. <laughs> I think it's really important we may raise and then I think is anyone else that. having problems hearing Joanne? Very distorted, yeah. Did you want to try again, Joanne? We'll see how we go. No, no. Is everyone else on mute? Let's all make sure we're on mute and that might may help. How's that? that? No. Margaret, that. anything you can do from your end? No, I was just checking. There's nothing, everything looks normal at my end, uh, Joanne, but you do sound very, very odd. <laughs> then you sound you sound fine, Margaret, and I'm assuming I do. So, yes, you do. So it might be something at Joanne's end. Yeah. It can sometimes be worth jumping out and jumping back in. Sometimes mm -hmm. that solves the problem. Yeah. Maybe I'll leave the meeting and join again. I'll try that. Try that. Is 
the joys of modern technology. This has been my know, whole day. I know. <laughs> Great conversation. Doesn't Joanne just have such um, amazing viewpoint and so experienced? Uh, just extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Such an interesting perspective. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I, I feel like we don't get that international and that humanitarian perspective as much, or certainly I haven't come across it in my 10 odd years in AM. Yeah. She's just rejoining now. Yeah. And I think also her cross her, you know, the fact that she's come from different sectors, you know, in the health sector, in the aid sector and so forth, you know, really helps to bring that kind of richness of, um, of viewpoint. How's that? Is that any better? Yes, that's, that's beautiful. beautiful. Well Great. done. Great idea, Marley. So where were we? Do we need to be reminded of the call? We were talking about um, um, urban environments yeah. and, and what is community and how do we build resilience in urban communities? Yeah. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's something we've been looking at, Anne, in Queensland because um, far north Queensland deals with cyclones, floods. You know, they've had 500 mils of rain in Cairns in the last two days and they're not asking for help. They're pretty happy. Was I know if that happened in the Gold Coast, there would be a whole different story. Um, and so it is about that urbanisation and the resilience of the community and the infrastructure. Um, I guess my experience in, so in Kenya, um, there was one of the, it's a, you know, we call it high density um, population. I mean, another terrible word for it is a slum. It was an informal housing um, um, area and it could have from a million to three million people in it, depending what was happening. No clean water, no sanitation, people in tin shacks. And during that um, post-election conflict that happened, um, there was, you know, there, there were a lot of conflict within there. And what I saw happen was that, okay, people went down their tribal lines, but there was a community within a community um, and they did look out for each other. So even though they were so highly densely populated and squeezed together, um, you know, the house in, in one area knew at least four families around them and they looked after them. I don't know whether you know, that will happen in Australia. I hope it will. I hope, I think we saw a bit of it during COVID that neighbours started to look out for neighbours. People came out on their driveways for Anzac Day in a show of unity. Um, so I think there is something there, but, but I think that we have to really look for it very hard. We had one episode of outbreak in Logan in Queensland and I know in Melbourne, you know, through that, those high rise blocks that, that had that outbreak. Um, there, there was some rallying of the community there, I think. So I'm hopeful, um, but unless we start building or working with that, those communities on their resilience to disaster, then I think that the impact will be will be much higher. So I think it is it is on us to to work with those communities and local government to see what that might look like. Joanne, I'm thinking as you're talking and, and coming from your British heritage uh, and thinking of um, smaller communities within the bigger urban community, my mind is going back to um, the situation in London in the Blitz and the bombing and where, you know, it was a huge metropolis with massive um, destruction going on for, for weeks and months with deaths and destruction of utilities. I'm wondering, in fact, as we pick up the point there, Merrily, of you know, what happens in um, an urban community, if there would be learnings, if we looked at that Blitz experience as a case study uh, from, from this particular perspective in this day and age and what we might learn from that so that we can be uh, a little prepared in our thinking, if and when it happens. Yeah, I think that um, I was reflecting on that Second World War experience as well, because I think that the communities did come together. And even when we had to move children out of those urban areas to protect them into the countryside, the mm. communities wrapped around them. Yeah. Um, so there is something about adversity that makes us forget that we're um, 
you know, we're too busy with our lives that we do actually then reach out to each other. But I think it is worth, yeah, examining what are the triggers for that so we can make sure, you know, foster it and support the communities in that um, because it is a big, a big worry. I was also reflecting on that Second World experience, Second World War experience and, you know, Churchill was heralded as this massive, you know, big, you know, the huge leader who, who did, you know, the best he could for the British public. But as soon as the war was over, we voted him out. So I, <laughs> there's something about you need a different leader in, in adversity versus in recovery and, and, you know, consensus building after. Um, I don't know whether there's a lesson for us there in COVID about what that looks like. Yes, yes. Well. I think one of the big things with World War Two in, in the UK was um, the blitz and the experiences of that actually showed everybody the difficulties that various communities were having. And that's where the whole manifesto for things like the National Health Service and, and social welfare came out of World War Two. Um, and and, you know, that was actually being developed during World War II. And there's that fabulous book um, by Titmus, um, Problems in Social Policy, absolutely fabulous book, mm -hmm. where he talks about all the things they learnt about the vulnerabilities in the communities. And that was what they built their post-war reconstruction and social welfare service on. So, and, you know, to some extent, COVID has been doing that for us. So is it, it has exposed even more issues with aged care <laughs> in Australia, for instance. Um, and now, you know, disability services and all sorts of things. So a crisis does expose your vulnerabilities. And then one of the questions is whether you can learn from that and build better afterwards or whether you just slide back into wherever you were. I think that's just so true, Anne. Um, and I think COVID has definitely highlighted um, a whole lot of our sort of systemic flaws and failures, whether it's housing and, you know, suddenly we were able to find housing for people sleeping rough. Um, you know, we suddenly found money to, to pay people on unemployment benefits, a living wage, a whole lot of things that we were suddenly able to put into place to actually address these inequalities and these vulnerabilities. Um, and, and, you know, I always like to say a community can only be as resilient as its underlying functioning. So if you've got a, a, a community that's, that's dispossessed or disadvantaged or disenfranchised, it, it will never be resilient, no matter how much stuff you put in, put in over the top. You know, you can put in all the fire plans and emergency plans and, and what have you that you like. That community, if it's not functioning and it's not thriving properly, will never be um, um, resilient. And, and going back to your earlier comment as well, and around um, urban communities, you know, I think, you know, we, we have a crisis of, of loneliness, and, you know, we have a loneliness epidemic. Um, you know, young mothers are incredibly isolated because everybody's out at work and, 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 um, and busy with their lives. And as, as you pointed out, you know, for some people, it's the work community that is their community. So in some ways, we've, we've structured our society and our lives to be, um, to be unresilient, I think. Yeah, and I think, I, I hope that someone somewhere is doing that thinking, Anne. Um, what, what, what has this showed us, this COVID, you know, disaster that we've been through and what do we improve out of it? You know, you're right, there were some big shifts around, you know, the whole global, you know, multilateralism, the UN system, all that happened out of the Second World War, the, the Bread and Woods Institutes that invested in, you know, economic recovery in Europe. Um, even though it was pretty difficult financial times, the, the emphasis was on rebuilding. And, and I hope that someone somewhere is doing that thinking for COVID. What does it look like? Maybe you have to tell a man. I think there are people doing it. And it's also, you know, I think accelerated some of the thinking around the climate change problem. I mean, yeah. the cumulative disasters, but also the, the realisation that we can actually do fairly big changes to the system and not wreck the whole thing. Um, and that where there's a will, um, we can actually do stuff. <laughs> um, but also, you know, sitting down and rethinking things like global um, tourism. It is 
in many ways an extractive industry. Um, and it's a precarious one to build whole economies on. So there are, there's, there's lots of people around thinking about this sort of thing, mm. whether we can capitalize on the moment is, I suppose, is the question. <laughs> I have my doubts. I kind of think for everyone who's out there thinking about those sort of proactive ways we can make it better and change, there's probably 10 other people itching to get back to the status quo. Mm. Yeah. Joanne, you've referred to leadership a few times, and I, I guess um, that comes back to what we've just been talking about, that sort of political will and, and, and leadership. But I'm interested in, in your leadership and, and how you're leading and how you're leading um, in Queensland. And, you know, who's inspired you along the way? What have you taken um, at, um, in terms of, of your leadership style? Uh, thank you. Um, I think that the, I worked initially, you know, like I say, for a non-government organisation overseas, and then I, I went on and worked for the British government. Um, and I was lucky enough to be seconded by the British government to the UN system. And I worked out pretty early on that I was much happier in the UN system, this multilateral environment that was more about collaboration and coordination than trying to impose the foreign policy view of the world. Um, and so I took a lot from that, that that is about bringing you know, the UN system at the biggest level gets criticised, but it does have everyone around the table and you have to listen to everyone's views and you don't necessarily have to agree with everyone. Um, and so, you know, the UN in, in many countries, we don't use the word command and control. It is all about coordination because to take on a command and control function you have to have a UN security resolution. And so that's a pretty serious step. So my role was only ever facilitation and coordination. Um, and so I guess my leadership style has been, been shaped like that. Um, and so I like to think of myself in the team now as a bit of the coach. Um, I'm not there to play the game for them. I'm not there to kick the ball in the goal, but I have to get them game fit, if you like. Um, and, and how do I do that? And, and so I try and, you know, empower people, you know, to be the best they can on game day rather than actually play the game myself now. Um, integrity is a big thing for me. Um, and, you know, doing what you say and, and, you know, being true, which, you know, sometimes get me in trouble in government organisations because you have to, you know, sometimes it is, you know, towing the line is, is what's seen as important. So... Um, I sometimes have to temper that and work out when's the right time to say the truth to power, as it were, um, to have the best impact or have a good outcome from that. Um, so, so that's part of it. Um, and then, yeah, I think that I, um, I take a lot of time to get to know my people um, or the people that I'm working with. And yeah, I, I don't know, I, I still got my nursey humour. So I try and bring that to the table. You know, you have to, you know, there's always a lighter, not always a lighter side of life or make light of anything, but there's some humour somewhere that helps you get through the day. So I think that's also important. That's great to hear, Joanne. There are a lot of humorless leaders out there um, and it's always nice to be able to have a bit of a chuckle uh, during the day just to get, help you get through. Um, I really liked your comments about being a coach or empowering um, people in your team. And I remember once somebody from the corporate se sector said to me, I was asking them about leadership and they said, you know, the key to advancing in your career is to make yourself redundant. So in other words, build your team and build the skills of the people that are working for you to basically take over what you're doing now. And that way you've got nowhere to go except up. And so it goes. So, um, so that's really terrific. Um, I'm really interested to know what strengths you see women bring to the emergency management sector and I guess to the humanitarian sector more broadly. Yeah, it's an interesting question. And when I saw it, I thought, mm, yeah, I guess, first of all, we bring the same as men. We're not, you know, we're, we're equal. We, we're not, you know. Um, but I do think that there is um, probably there's a, a larger part of us as women that are communicators, negotiators, 
um, trying to you know get to compromise to get the best outcome. Um, and I don't know whether that's about, you know, you have to do that with your kids every day, whether that's where it comes from. I don't believe it's biological. I don't think there's anything biologically different about us. Um, so whether that's, you know, part of nurture and, and what we've had to do to, to, you know, become leaders, there's part of that as well, is you do have to, um, you know, be honest, you, you have to prove yourself by what you do and how you negotiate and how you communicate. So we've had to finesse those skills, I think, as women, um, whereas men get a bit of an easier ride and can, you know, sort of communicate in a different way and it's accepted, whereas I, I don't think it is for women. We judge slightly differently and so we work much harder at it. Um, so, I, yeah, I guess I don't believe there's anything biologically different about it, but the environments that we've all grown up in or our experiences tend to make us behave slightly differently, I think. And that's a, I think that's a positive thing. I think that, that those are the leadership skills I sort of respect, the communicators, the negotiators, the, you know, able to hear all sides, you know. That's great. What um, a great insight. I remember when I was a mother of small toddlers thinking, you know, any mother of toddlers that can negotiate toddlers either to get into bed, into the bath, eat their dinner, whatever it is, just send them off to the Middle East and they'll sort it all out in no time, you know. <laughs> I think there is something to be said for that, um, those negotiation and communication skills. That's great. Um, what do you do to work to, I guess, support, you know, young women coming up through the ranks? Yeah, it's really important and it's really important in QFES at the moment. We, we are not an organisation that's a representative of the community. So um, we, you know, and it's probably, you know, one of the reasons they had to look externally to get their first female assistant commissioner, which is really unfortunate. Um, they should have been able to grow someone internally into the role. Um, but I think it is about, um, you know, we have to be purposeful in this and when when you spot talent you know male as much as female um you have to challenge those people give them you know projects um to broaden their experience um give them opportunity um really you know with the coaching i think is really important um and i think it is you know, you can tell by my career, I've moved around and I haven't been scared to move around. And I think that helps grow women in the sector. Different roles, different challenges to get that depth and breadth is really important. So to carve out those opportunities for people, I think is the most important thing to do as a leader. That's fantastic, thank you. We're, we've got about five minutes left, unfortunately. Um, I feel like we could talk all night. All we need is to, uh, to get Uber in and order dinner for us. Um, were there any other questions that any, I'm sure you all do, I'm sure you've got many questions, but um, any last questions? Kelly, in the dark, have we heard from you? No, perhaps not. Can you hear not, me? But can you hear yes. me? Yes, we Sorry, can. Sorry, I, I was on. I was on mute. Um, no, I've been listening intently, and, and if I'm honest, quite um, envious of all your your careers and expertise. Uh, I mean, I can relate to lots of things that you've talked about. I, um, unlike most of you, I, I came into my career quite late. I mean, I had my children um, young in my early twenties, and I've I've done my three uni degrees in the last 10 years whilst being a single mum um, raising my boys. So all the comments about the challenges of motherhood and, and our incredible skill set, I completely relate to. Um, but in terms of, I mean, I was, although this is a discussion about disasters and I'm just on my last subject of my master's in disaster resilience uh, now, um, I, I was, listening with a with a um a perspective of um thinking more along career um rather than disaster management in itself because i i'm 47 and um i'm an environmental scientist environmental health officer and my disaster expertise has been um all through volunteering with red cross um and i have found it incredibly difficult 
to try and break into um, disaster employment. You know, I, um, I mean, I'm intelligent, I'm educated, I'm, I've got a lot of very transferable skills. I worked in allied health for 10 years. I did live in Cairns. Um, I was literally um, working in the hospital when it was evacuated during Cyclone Yazzie, which was what prompted me to then um, volunteer with Red Cross. And yet I find when I go for, uh, when I apply for jobs in the disaster field, I'm told you don't have enough experience. And, and yet quite often, a lot of the people interviewing me and when I ask about the people working in the teams, they've come from backgrounds in communication or um, other roles where they fell into disaster management because they happened to be working somewhere when a disaster hit and got thrown into um, uh, you know, incident management or response um, where they were working and then their career took off in that direction. And I, I'm just feeling so frustrated because I feel like I've, I've tried to do all the things like I've, I've worked in, in um, places during disasters. I've worked, you know, I've been in the last year, I've worked um, in environmental health with COVID response. And like I said, when I worked in allied health, I was working very much um, involved with um, direct patient care during the evacuation of the hospital, which was unprecedented, evacuating a major public hospital in Australia, um, as well as having personal experience of having to be evacuated where I was living. Um, and then I've worked in incident management and community recovery with Red Cross. And I've got, you know, now I've got all these formal qualifications that have cost me a fortune. And um, yeah, I just find it, it's really hard to break into. I mean, there's there's endless volunteering opportunities, but at 47 with a very big hex debt and, um, you know, needing to uh, support myself and my kids and feeling that I've earned a paid job in disasters rather than being stuck as a volunteer for my whole career. Yeah, that I'm just, um, I'm frustrated. And I, it, the more seminars like this that I listen to, the more variety I hear in the background of people um, and particularly women, they've come from nursing, they've come from academia. Some of them have come from, you know, other things that you wouldn't expect like marketing or economic um, careers. And it's such a, a diverse workforce, which is wonderful, but I still have found it, um, yeah, quite hard to break into even um, internally applying. I work in local government now and I used to work in, Queensland Health and I found it just impossible to break through from, from other um, departments into, into the teams that do disaster management. And now I've been told that my um, resume is qualification heavy, but you know, I mean, you, you do that formal education to give you that, that underpinning knowledge and that formal evidence-based knowledge so that you can apply that with your passion and with your um, experience wherever you've gained that from and um, yeah so no I, I'm just listening with a little bit of envy and a lot of respect for the, the people that are speaking and um, hoping that I can uh, get the opportunity at some point to contribute more what I feel I have to offer um, and you know I've also in the last couple of years I've done a change management certification and some leadership courses and just with everything that's been going on in the world like whole Trump era and and you know the Me Too movement and um, the rise of, of amazing women um, like the Prime Minister of New Zealand and Iceland and, and some other countries around the world it is an exciting time where a lot of the um, sort of empathetic qualities and, and multi-skilling qualities that women I think intrinsically develop over their life um, as they juggle multiple responsibilities and, and workloads in home, community and workplaces. I think it's, it's an exciting time to be a woman and, and try to be um, forging your way in, in, in probably a time where we do have um, more opportunities than previous generations, but it's still really hard, <laughs> I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, so. I was um, listening to everything with that um, career veil over, over my ears of, of um, just trying to um, learn and, and be humble and open and find any little pearls of wisdom uh, that I can cling to and, and apply. And yeah, so thank you. Um, thanks to the amazing 
inspiring speakers. No, thank you, Kelly. And thank you for sharing your frustration. And please know that you are not alone in struggling to break into the emergency management and disaster resilience sector. We do hear this um, often, and not just from women either, but, but from men as well. And as you point out, it's often people that just sort of stumble into it somehow, um, not, by, not by design, but by accident. Joanne, did you have any tips that you wanted to share with Kelly around applying for jobs or breaking in? Um, it's hard, isn't it? I, I hear you, Kelly. Um, I, I would say don't give up. Um, sometimes it is a numbers game. Keep trying. Um, are you still based in Queensland? Yeah, I'm, I'm living in Brisbane. I've been in Brisbane for four years now and I absolutely love it. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm from Sydney originally, but I lived in Cairns for about nine years and that's where I did my environmental science degree and that's where I worked in allied health and um, the beginning of my environmental health career and when I did um, incident management and community recovery with Red Cross that was that was around Brisbane and Mackay after Cyclone mm -hmm. Debbie um, mm -hmm. as well as up in, in Cairns so I feel um, as someone that studied environmental science um, majoring in hydrology and, and natural hazards and then um, environmental health and and you know in and volunteering with Red Cross, I feel like I I've got a very broad understanding of Queensland. You know the communities, the remoteness, the regional areas, the different um, weather, the governance. Because when you work for Queensland Health and when you work for councils, you learn a lot about um, a lot of the inequities that exist just just by virtue of the different funding that goes to different. Um, areas, different councils' budgets, and the, the different socioeconomic um, issues that exist in in um, major cities compared to regional areas, compared to remote communities. Um, I've done a lot of field work in those remote areas, um, and so I have, feel like I have a good understanding of the cultural um, issues with Indigenous um, communities as well. And yeah, so it, it's, I, I um, although I I'm, I'm, think I'll always feel like I'm a Sydney girl, my whole um, tertiary education and, and career has been based in Queensland and I feel firmly grounded in, in that and I'm, and I'm quite happy to stay. I, I don't necessarily seek to leave Queensland. I feel like it's a really dynamic um, place and I've made a, a life here. So, yeah, I really appreciate it. Kelly, I just put my email in the chat, so I'm happy if you want to come out and have a look at Kedron and we can talk through who are the agencies involved, who it might be worth sort of targeting, if that helps. Wow, thank you. I'm on my phone. I'm just trying to work out. Oh, there it is. Yes, got it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thank you. It should be pretty straightforward. It's just Joanne Greenfield at QFES and just yes. then like any. Email. That's wonderful. That's amazingly generous of you, Joanne. Thank you so much. And but might I say that's what this network is for. We are here to connect as women who work in the sector, to provide each other with opportunities, to promote what we do, to support each other. Um, and we just saw that in action. So how absolutely fantastic is that? Yes, thank you. Um, a huge thank you to Joanne. Um, Joanne, that was just a fabulous conversation. Um, we all loved hearing about your career, your insights, um, and really what you bring to emergency management, I think is just so rich um, and so profound. And, and your worldwide view is something we don't get very often. And, and we're really lucky to have been able to, to hear from you. So thank you very, very much. And thank you for inviting me. I think, you know, I didn't know much about the network, but Bridget's given me a, a rundown on it all. So I'm keen to be involved and, and to learn from everyone in the network. So thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, sad to say good night, but good night. Um, we hope to see you at the next or event. Um, and Kelly, keep an eye on our um, on our job section in our newsletter, and and we'll certainly keep an eye out for jobs in Brisbane and, and promote those through the newsletter for you. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. All the best. Thank you, Margaret, for behind the scenes. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Thank you. And Bye. Thank you very Bye. much, Joanne. That was wonderful. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Ruth. Bye. <laughs>